Marker. My name is Jeffrey Boyer Chapman. I'm Lance Bass. I'm Connor Franta. I'm Raja. This is Stonewall Out Loud. In 1969, the Stonewall Riot sparked a revolution that continues to this day. We stand on the shoulders of our elders. There was never any time that I felt more scared than I felt that night. First-hand accounts of that night were tape recorded. Without their voices and their actions, we would not have the freedoms that we have today. Today, a new generation discovers their voices. It's important for their voices to live through us. 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 I'm Lance Bass, and I'm playing Gene Harwood. And I'm Michael Turton, and I'm playing Bruce Merrow. I am uh, Gene Harwood, and my age is 80. I, I don't, I don't, I don't know if it's really true, but now people do refer to us as the two oldest gay men in America. We do, ha I think, have maybe a, a record relationship of almost 60 years together. I think so many more people can relate when they actually hear the first person account of what they've been through yeah. instead of someone else just repeating it like a textbook. It's so special to be able to have some kind of connection like that with, yeah. with, with a couple that helped let us be a couple. Being gay before Stonewall was a, a very difficult proposition because we felt that in order to survive, we had to try to look and act as, as rugged and, and manly as possible to get by in, in, the, in the society that was uh, really very much against us. My name is Randy Wicker. I was the first openly gay person to appear on radio in 1962 and on television in 1964 as a self-identified homosexual. In the era before Stonewall, people felt a, a need to hide because of the uh, le precarious legal position they were in. They would lose their jobs. Uh, there was a great hostility, socially speaking, in the sense that people found out you were gay. They assumed you were a communist or a child molester or any of another dozen stereotypes that were rampant in the public media at the time. How did you find that bravery? Because it feels like you had everything to lose. It wasn't bravery. I was a journalist, and I was the first one to break into radio. We weren't allowed on the radio. And I was in my early 20s. I had nothing to lose. Yeah. And I could put my face and voice out there. I'm Jerry Fair, and I'm 80 years old. I started a gay lifestyle in 1948, when I was around 39 or 40. At that time, if there was even a suspicion that you were a lesbian, you were fired from your job, and you were in such a position of disgrace that you slunk out without saying goodbye even to the people that liked you and you liked. Never even bothered to clean your desk. You just disappeared. You just disappeared. You went quietly because you were afraid that the recriminations that would come if you even stood there and protested would be worse than just leaving. My name is Sylvia Rivera. My name before that was Bray Rivera until I started dressing in drag in 1961. The era before Stonewall was a hard era. There was always the gay bashings on the drag queens by heterosexual men, women, and the police. We learned to live with it because it was part of the lifestyle at that time, I guess. But none of us were very happy about it. Her voice was so familiar to me. It sounded like a, like a friend that, uh, that I would have known personally. 
holding up another man's hand, glancing over at another person of the same sex in that way, dressing in drag, even in the slightest way, painted nails, your nails painted as a cis-identifying male. Sylvia's voice is very, very profound. The voice still sounds the same to me. It is, it is the voice of struggle. It is the same voice of passion and revolution. My name is Tree, and in those days, I was, I was Freddie, Freddie Tree, and, and I was 30 years old. So you actually still work at the Stonewall Inn? Yep, I don't want to retire. Some of the kids at the bar call me dad, some call me mom, and the owners call me granny. <laughs> We're a family. What was it like growing up in the 60s? Well, growing up in the 60s was, well, if you were gay, mm -hmm. it was not good. The cops never liked us because we had nicknames for them. We called cops Betty Badge, Patty Patrol, and Lily Law. And we'd actually walk past a cop and say, is Lily throwing a party for Patty tomorrow? And the cops knew that was them. It was uh, very difficult. There was entrapment laws. Cops could pick you up and then swear that you picked them up. If we stood on the corner long enough, we got arrested for congregating. Cops loved whacking you in the back of the leg with a nightstick. I went to jail 10, 12 times just for being in a gay bar. My name is Martin Bruins. In 1969, I was a drag queen known as Miss Martin. I was in college in the day and on the streets at night. I think I got a better education at night. Gay bashing was a city sport. Mm. The police wouldn't help you. They thought you provoked it. There was a law that you had to have three articles of male clothing. They could get you for that if you weren't wearing two articles of it, and socks did not count. If your name was soiled by being gay or faggot, you either had to move or suffer. My name is Seymour Pine. In 1968, I was assigned as deputy inspector in charge of public morals in the first division in the police department, which covered the Greenwich Village area. It was the duty of public morals to enforce all laws concerning vice and gambling, including prostitution, narcotics, and laws and regulations concerning homosexuality. The part of the penal code which applied to drag queens was section 240.35, section four, being masked or in any manner disguised by unusual or unnatural attire or facial alteration, loiters, remains, or congregates in a public place with other At that time, we lived no at the Arista Hotel. Except that such we sit around, just try to figure out when, it, when this harassment would come to an end. And we, we would always dream that one day it would come to an end. And we prayed and we looked for it. We wanted to be human beings. My name is Red Mahoney. I've been hanging out, drinking, partying, and working in the gay bars for the last 30 years. Red Mahoney organized the first Christopher Street Pride Festival and was a regular at Stonewall. In the era before Stonewall, all, all of the bars, 90% of the bars, were mafia controlled. There wasn't that many gay bars. You'd have maybe one, two uptown in the Upper East Side. They would get closed down, and there'd be one or two in the West Side. They'd get closed down, and Midtown, there'd be one, two, three, maybe open. As they would get closed down, they'd move around, and they were dumps. This was the entrance and the bar. This side was the dance floor with tables. Mm -hmm. 
and there was an arch in the middle of the room where we went from one side to the other. And if you go into the bathrooms on one side, you can come out the other. Okay. That's where some of the guys put the drag on in the bathrooms and makeup. Because if they walked the streets, they could have got beat up. It was against the law, you know, to serve a known homosexual alcohol in New York City. That's why there's mirrors in bars, because you could not turn around and talk to the person. You had to talk through the mirror. They had to protect themselves so when the, if a cop came in, you know, yeah, it looked like a normal bar. I'm Joan Nessel, co-founder of what is now the largest collection of lesbian culture in the world. The police raided lesbian bars regularly, and they did it they both did it in the most um, obvious way, which was hauling women away in paddy wagons. But they did, there was regular weekend harassment, which would consist of the police coming in regularly to get their payoffs. And in the sea colony, we had a back room with a red light. And when that red light went on, it meant the police would be arriving in around 10 minutes. And so we all had to sit down at our tables. And we would be sitting there almost like school children. And the cops would come in. Now, depending on who was on, which cop was on, if it was some that really resented the butch women, who were with many times very beautiful women, we knew we were in for it because what would happen is they would start harassing one of these women and saying, hi, huh, you think you're a man, come outside, we'll show you. And the woman would be dragged away. They'd throw up against a wall and they'd say, so you think you're a man, let's see what you got in your pants. And they would put their hand down her pants. The stone wall, oh, that was a good boy. That was. Just to get into the stone wall, you'd walk up and you'd knock on the front door. You'd knock and the door would open and, there, what do you want? A Mary sent me, good, come on in, girls. You know, the stone wall, like all gay bars at that time, were painted black. Charcoal black. And what was the funny part? The place would be so dimly lit, but as soon as the cops are gonna come in, to collect their percentage or whatever they were coming in for, from it being a nice, dimly lit dump. The place was lit up like Luna Park. You felt, well, two guys, and that's very often all we sent in would be two men. Could handle 200 people. I mean, you tell them to leave, and they leave. And you say, show me your identification, and they all take out their identification and file out, and, and that's it. And you say, okay, you're not a man, you're a woman, or you're vice versa, and, and you wait over there. I mean, this is a, a, a kind of power that you have, and you never gave it a second thought. The drag queen took a lot of oppression, and we had to, we, we were at a point where I guess nothing would have stopped us. I guess, as they say, or as Shakespeare says, we were ladies in waiting, just waiting for the thing to happen. And when it did happen, we were there. On June 27th, just before midnight, officers from NYPD's Public Morals Squad raided the Stonewall. A number of those at the bar had spent the earlier part of that day at Judy Garland's funeral. It was a very hot June night, 1969. We all felt bad, because we, we loved Judy. She used to go to gay bars. She was a wonderful human being. And we were all laughing and talking to each other when the cops came in around midnight. Normally, they didn't raid the bar because it was a gay bar. They raided the bar for uh, protection money. The, co the cops got money. It was called Brown Bag Friday. When the cops went everywhere and they took a brown bag of money, went back to the precinct and split it up. But the night of the riots, the Stonewall was raided by other police rather than the 6th Precinct. There was never any reason to feel that uh, anything of any unusual situation would occur that night. You could actually feel it in the air. You really could. I guess Judy Garland's death just really helped us really hit the fan. For some reason, things were different this night. 
As we were bringing the prisoners out, they were resisting. People started gathering in front of the Sheridan Square Park right across the street from Stonewall. People were upset. No, we're not going to go. And people started screaming and hollering. One drag queen, as we put her in the car, opened the door on the other side and jumped out. Uh, at which time uh, we had to chase that person and uh, he was caught, put back into the car, made an another attempt to get out the same door, the other door, and uh, at that point we had to handcuff the, uh, the person. From this point on, things really began to get crazy. My name is Robert Rivera, and my nickname is Birdie, and I've been cross-dressing all of my life. I remember the night of the riots. The police were escorting queens out of the bar and into the paddy wagon, and there was this one particularly outrageously beautiful queen with stacks and stacks of Elizabeth style, Elizabeth Taylor style hair, and uh, she was asking them not to push her. And they continued to push her, and she turned around, and she mashed the cop with her high heel. She knocked him down, and then she proceeded to frisk him for her, the keys to the handcuffs that were on them. She got them, and uh, she undid herself and passed them to another queen that was behind her. Well, that's when all hell broke loose at that point. And then we were, we had to get back into Stonewall. My name is Howard Smith. On the night of the Stonewall riots, I was a reporter for the Village Voice, locked inside with the police, covering it for my column. It really did appear that that crowd, because we could look through little peepholes in the plywood windows, we could look out, and we could see that the crowd, well, my guess was within five, 10 minutes, it was probably several thousand people. Two, 2,000, easy, and they were yelling, kill the cops police brutality, let's get them, we're not gonna take this anymore, let's we get them. We noticed a group of uh, persons uh, attempting to uproot uh, one of the uh, parking meters in which, they, in which they did succeed. And they then uh, used that parking meter to, uh, as a battering ram to break down the door. And they did in fact open the door. They crashed it in, and at that point was when they began throwing uh, Molotov cocktails into the place. It was a situation that uh, we didn't know how we were going to be able to control. I remember someone throwing a Molotov cocktail. I don't know who the person was, but I mean, I saw that, and I just said to myself in Spanish, I said, oh my God, the revolution is finally here. And I just like started screaming, freedom. <laughs> We're free at last, you know, and it felt really good. There were a couple of cops stationed on either side of the door with their pistols, like in a combat stance, aimed in the door area. A couple of others were stationed in other places, behind, like, a pole, another one behind the bar, all of them with their guns ready. I don't think up to that point I ever had ever seen cops that scared. Remember, these were pros, but everybody was frightened. There's no question about that. I know I was frightened. And I'd been in, in combat situation, and uh, there was never any time that I felt more scared than I felt that night. And, uh, I mean, there was just, you know, there was no place to run. Once the tactical police force showed up, I think that really incited us a little bit more. And then all of a sudden, the worst thing that could possibly happen in a riot, there was silence. The loudest thing in a riot. But you could hear like a stormtrooper movement. And then the crowd parted and there they were, the tactical police force, dressed for riots. Shields. Shields and every type of equipment. And here was a bunch in front of them of these Nelly Queens that were looking at them like, 
like that and, and did not know what to do. We didn't know what to do, we didn't, and they didn't know what to do. But we had to do something. And we all grabbed hands, arms, and started a kick line and started singing. We are the village girls. We, we wear, wear our hair and curls. curls. We wear our dungarees above our Nellies. We are the village girls. We wear our hair and curls. We wear our dungarees above our Nellies. <laughs> and the police went crazy hearing that, and they just immediately rushed us. We gave one kick and fled. My name is Rudy, and uh, the night of the Stonewall, I was 18. Rudy Grillo was a young producer for a local radio station at the time of Stonewall. And to tell you the truth, that night I was doing more running than fighting. I remember looking back from 10th Street, and there on Waverly Street, there was a police, I believe, on his uh, cop, and his, on his stomach in his tactical uniform and his helmet and everything else with a drag queen straddling him. She was beating the hell out of him with her shoe. Whether it was a high heel or not, I don't know. But she was beating the hell out of him. It was hysterical. My name is Mama Jean. Uh, I'm a lesbian. I remember on that night, I was in a gay bar, a woman's bar, called Cookies. We were coming out of the gay bar, going toward 8th Street. And that's when we saw everything happen, blasting away, people getting beat up, police coming from every direction, uh, hitting women as well as men with their nightsticks, uh, gay men running down the street with blood all over their face. We decided right then and there, whether we were scared or not, we didn't think about it, we just jumped in. Here, this queen is going completely bananas, you know, jumping and hitting the windshield. The next thing you know, the taxi cab was being turned over, the cars were being turned over, things. Windows were shattering all over the place, fires were burning around the place. It was, a be it was beautiful, it really was. It was really beautiful. I remember one cop coming at me, hitting me with the nightstick in the back of my legs. I broke loose and I went after him. I grabbed his nightstick, my girlfriend went behind him. She was a strong son again. I wanted him to feel the same pain I felt. And I kept on saying to him, how do you like the pain? Do you like it? Do you like it? And I kept on hitting him and hitting him. I was angry. I wanted to kill him. At that particular minute, I wanted to kill him. I wanted to do every destructive thing that I could think of at that time to hurt anyone that had hurt us through the years. It's like just when you see a man protecting his own life. They weren't the queens that people called them. They were men fighting for their lives. And I'd fight alongside them any day, no matter how old I was. It was the only time in 2,500 years that a group of gay men could display valor. Once we were able to display valor, we had won some hearts and minds of even the butchers men in the city. I know my father, when I got home that morning, said, it's about time you guys did something. A lot of heads were bashed, and it didn't hurt their true feelings. They all came back from the and war. Nothing, that's when you could tell that nothing could stop us at that time or at any time in the future. The next day, gay power graffiti appeared in the West Village. And the next night, thousands returned to Stonewall to see what would happen next. There were hundreds of people walking on the street and the cops watching everybody. I noticed a few people holding hands and everything. Homo nest raided, queen bees are stinging mad. The entire city knew we had rioted. Four days later, I was passing this sanitation worker, this huge man, who was throwing these garbage bit bags into the back of the truck. And he gave me this look, and he was such a rough, hostile-looking man. I thought, oh, my God, I should have crossed the street. But no, he raised his fist in a salute. And I knew right then and there we were going to start to win hearts and minds. When Stonewall happened, uh, Bruce and I were still in the closet. Uh, where, where we had been for nearly 40 years. 
but we realized that this was this was a a, a tremendous thing that had happened at, at Stonewall and it gave us a feeling that we were not going to be remaining closeted for very much longer and soon thereafter we did come out of the closet my name is Ginny Apuzo in uh, 1969 I was uh, in the convent and um, when Stonewall hit the press it hit me with a bolt of lightning it was as if I had uh, an incredible release um, of my own outrage at having to sequester so much of my life I made way, my way down I seem to recall um, in subsequent nights being uh, down on the you know kind of just in the periphery looking observer clearly an observer clearly longing to have that courage to come out and um, it was a matter as I recall it was only a matter of weeks before I left the convent and um, started a new life I think she seems very badass. Um, I think it takes so much courage to leave behind the life that you thought you wanted and that you always saw for yourself in pursuit of who you actually are. I felt very connected to Ginny. It's like hearing her, there's something about like hearing someone's voice and it just, it really connects the past and the present. It reminds me that it's important for everyone to live their most authentic lives because we're standing on the shoulders of so many people who did it in the face of adversity. I'm Henry Baird. In 1969, I was in the US Army, a Specialist Three stationed at Long Bin Post near Saigon in Vietnam. I remember I was having lunch in the Army mess, reading the Armed Forces news summary of the day and there was a short paragraph describing a riot led by homosexuals in Greenwich Village against the police. And my heart was filled with joy. I thought about what I had read frequently, but I had no one to discuss it with. And secretly within myself, I decided that when I came back stateside, if I should survive to come back stateside, I would come out as a gay person, and I did. For those of us in public morals, after the uh, Stonewall incident, things were completely changed from what they had previously been. They, they suddenly were not submissive anymore. They now suddenly had gained a, a new type of uh, courage. And it seemed as if they didn't care anymore about whether their identities were, were made known. We were now dealing with human beings. Today, I live in a senior citizen apartment building. What's different now is that I can be free. I have a daughter who's a senior citizen and my son is 58. They know about my homosexuality, and yet I still don't have the personal courage to not care if these yentists in the building know that Jerry's a lesbian. Well, I retired from the police department in 1976. 20 years have passed, I'm, I'm gonna be 70 in a few months. I still don't know the answers. I would still like to know the answers. I would like to know whether I was wrong, whether I was right, in, in ever thinking that there was a difference, in ever thinking that maybe you shouldn't trust a, a, a homosexual because something is missing in his personality. of lesbian culture, which was created four years after Stonewall, owes, at least from my part, its creation to that night and the courage that found its voice in the streets. That night, in some very deep way, we finally found our place in history. Not as a dirty joke, not as a doctor's case study, not as a freak, but as a people. Today I'm a 38-year-old drag queen. I can 
keep my long hair, I can pluck my eyebrows, and I can work wherever the hell I want. <laughs> and I'm not going to change for anybody. If I change, then I feel that, I've, that I'm losing what 1969 brought into my life. And that was to be totally free. Fly me to the moon and let me play among the stars. Just 22 days after Stonewall, man landed on the moon for the first time. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. It wasn't until 46 years later that marriage equality became law. And the fight for rights and freedom from oppression continues to this day, both at home and abroad. I think knowing our history is important because it teaches us where we came from, and it can show us, oddly enough, where to go in the future or what to avoid. Truly, the fight never stops, never become complacent. It didn't really, like, hit home until somebody made the connection for me that, like, Stonewall was the origin of pride, and that was something that I, I originally didn't know. I was walking past Stonewall with some friends, and it was, um, you know, it seemed very unassuming, but something about the energy of, of Stonewall was so electric and magnetic that I knew something extraordinary had taken place there. I just got chills. <laughs> I would love for, for our grandkids, our great-grandchildren, to remember me as someone that was trying to help. Yeah. I want them to remember me for having a great butt. <laughs> but apart from that, pun intended, um, I just want them to remember me as just being a really kind, empathetic, nice yeah. person. The golden rule, just treat everybody the way you'd like to be treated, truly. Now look, my mom always said, as long as you're not hurting anyone, truly hurting someone, yes. you be and do whatever you want to be and do. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Best lesson I ever had.